Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for coming so, uh, so late in the day. Uh, this is the second of these, um, what are rather glamorously called VIP interviews. Um, we couldn't get a VIP, so we've got Tim Weller. No, that's unkind. I, I um, met Tim, uh, I think it was about 1983, rather scarily, when um, we both first started in the world of business media. Um, I, I can't believe we have reached this age and we're still doing the same shit for a living, really, Tim. But um, he's had a, uh, an extraordinary career and uh, was one of the uh, arguably most successful business to business media entrepreneurs of, uh, of our generation and has lived through a journey of being uh, a small startup, being a private company, being a private equity backed company, being a public company, going from public to private being burdened under the weight of enormous debt, writing money off, making people lots of money and almost everything in between. And somewhere in the middle of that, he's actually done some media stuff as well and <laughs> published some stuff too. So um, this is kind of pretty informal. So if you want to say something during, you know, we, we might do Q and A's at the end, but you know, if you just want to say something, <coughs> uh, put your hand up uh, or just wave at me and I'll, and I'll come to you. Uh, or um, if you want to tweet, um, uh, if you hashtag it with hash, PE 2012. I'll um, I'll I'll try and keep an eye on it if you want to ask something. Uh, yesterday that was quite fun when we uh, had uh, Carla Basazzi from the Huffington Post here because we were getting sort of two extremes of people saying the Huffington Post was a really great thing to being this is the worst thing that could ever happen to media uh, all, all at the same time, which was kind of quite interesting. So Tim, welcome. Thank you for coming uh, and um, uh, and for um, for joining us today. Um, I think I'd like to go right back to the beginning. Oh dear. <laughs> when, when, when we started in all this, in business media about, what it got, 30 years ago, can you believe, what was different? Oh, what was different? I, I had a 28 inch waist. Um, <laughs> what was different? God, I think we overcomplicate it, so I'm going to sort of, do you know, fundamentally, I don't think much was different. I really don't think much was different, but we, we have today, I think, overcomplicated what we do. And, you know, our business is fundamentally a very simple business. Um, and, you know, we are in the business of creating great content that we push to audiences. And I think technology is an enabler um, in the same way that in the early days when we started, uh, print was an enabler or the Royal Mail or data, uh, whatever they're called, run. Um, we're an enabler. Um, so fundamentally, I think business is still great fun. It's uh, a business where you've got lots of young people. Um, but yeah, the challenges are probably the thing that set it apart from then today. I think, we, you, to be honest, I think we've got actually brighter people, if I can put it. That's really disrespectful to my bosses in 30 years ago. But I do think there are brighter people. Well, you mean you're brighter than they were? No, fuck that. I'm not. I'm not. I'm a third class zoology graduate who doesn't know shit, but um, I think, you know, what I have been reasonably good at is uh, recruiting talent and uh, getting people to do the job. But I think, I, th I think we had principally salespeople running businesses historically, and we now have a much r more rounder uh, set of management um, in, in B2B. If you go back to that time, you, you were in danger of using um, the, the um, conference bingo expression, which Patrick Smith, who works for us, always tweets and says, you know, have a drink, which is content is king. Um, and, but if you look back at that time when we kind of thought content was king, it turned out that that wasn't true, wasn't it? Because when the new means of distribution arrived, everybody abandoned business magazines and many of them have died. So we weren't, well, okay, we weren't let, as good let, as, as we thought we were. Yeah, but let's go, back, let's go back to the basics. Content was king and is still king, but in those days, ads were content. If you take computing or Computer Weekly, which we both sparred against each other in 30 years ago, um, the, you know, the fact that we ran 100 pages of jobs every week was a absolutely essential content to that product. Um, many people um, so registered to Computing or Computer Weekly purely for jobs. And they didn't necessarily look at the, the words, uh, uh, con the editorial content. They looked at the jobs as their primary source. Now, I actually remember that was really highlighted five years after I left uh, VNU to go and launch a business for Centaur um, to compete with a thing called Accountancy Age. Um, as the, the, the editorial teams of um, VNU went on strike. And I don't know if you remember it, but they went on strike for about 
six to eight weeks, where for six to eight weeks, none of their business magazines had any editorial content at all. They were just job sheets. And I couldn't fucking compete with it. It was extraordinary that we had a brand in corporate money, a new accountant back then, that just couldn't still cut through in those days because jobs were king, marketplace was king. And I think, yes, with, with what happened over the course of the, the sort of early noughties with the growth and explosion in job sites, that is where um, horizontal business magazines, where content wasn't, editorial content wasn't necessarily the king, that's when they got obliterated because not many B2B publishers did the right thing and follow that path. They allowed pure plays to follow that path. And I know your old shop actually did do a very good job with Total. Well, they did it very late. Yeah, I mean, they did, they did a very, very good job, they, but they yeah, did it very late. Yeah, but they, they followed, you know, Cowling's business in Essex, who in four years, Robbie made himself uh, worth about 150 million quid by being an ex-programmer who created a community together under... Uh, so that, that, that turn is interesting. There's two interesting things you've said there. The, f the first is, and I've not heard anybody say it quite like that before, is that when you, when you say content is king, you mean the ads as well, which is kind of an in interesting kind of spin on it. And then your, your tale of the demise of business magazines consequent on the loss of the job advertising, I think is kind of seminal. And we all kind of, I mean, I think we'd have to put our hands up and say, as, a, as an industry, we made a mess of that. You know, we lost a big kind of chunk of our, a big kind of chunk of our revenue. If you look at what's happening now, and business magazines are still closing now, many are still struggling, uh, and are struggling to kind of make a living, what can be done now to prop up the traditional media companies who are publishing in these spaces? Is it too late, like it was too late for jobs? No, certainly not. Um, and I have these regular debates with advisors who come in and look and assess the quality of the market and the competitors and you know what businesses you might be able to buy i mean you certainly don't think it's too late you just bought two businesses that are absolutely in this uh, in this world um look it, let's again let's not over complicate it um business magazines get launched whether they're online only or in print they get launched because people think there's a a gap in the market sometimes there isn't a market in the gap and sometimes you have to move on from that space. So there's been a lot of debate. We talked about this on the phone. There's been a lot of debate recently about paid content um, and its demise under the Guardian's ownership. Now, my personal view is there's no market in that gap. People have been trying to build really successful uh, B2B assets in the media space for a long time. Forgive me, I know you got the media oh. briefing. But, you know, as pure play online properties or print assets, there, it, sometimes there isn't a market in the gap. Now. There are many business markets that still rely on very good quality information. They rely both on that information to do their jobs better. They rely on that information because of regulatory change um, in a, the given market that they work in to be able to uh, continue to trade in those jobs. So uh, a lot of what we do at Incisive has regulation at its core, at its heart, and the change in regulation um, is the driver for people to need to come into our web properties, to come onto our mobile sites, to download stuff from our bookstore, because they, they need to actually go off and take exams or get continuous professional development. So, so yeah. can, can, can that apply in kind of very, I, I entirely mm. get that that works for you in the legal sector, yeah. for example, or, in, or, or, in, uh, or around investment Risk. week and, yeah. and so on. But can that equally well apply to titles like computing, which you now own, or, or, or those other kind of traditional well, titles, where it's actually much more difficult to create okay. that kind of regulatory uh, environment okay. to deliver where, that kind of data and information. Where, where, I mean, you look at, um, I mean, my old shop, Centaur, you look at the old VNU business, you look at uh, a lot of the great success in the Haymarket B2B business. A lot of that success was built in the 70s and the 80s through, again, creating horizontal business magazines that served a, uh, you know, like computing, like marketing week, like marketing, um, uh, like accountancy age. These were horizontal titles broadcast in nature that again de were dependent from their revenue um, on recruitment. I personally believe, and I'm lucky since 1995, since I started Incisive, I have not gone down that road. 
My, my focus, my strategy is on narrow cast. We didn't launch our business with a penny of recruitment in it. So actually, we never, when we started, we never had that issue of seeing recruitment revenues dive. Our, our model is narrow. The more narrow and more specialist, the better. Um, because frankly, you can deliver uh, much more focused and valuable content to those communities. And you can either then charge a premium for that content or you can charge a premium to wrap a message around that content, irrelevant, irrelevant of, of, of platform. So look, yes, if you are running a horizontal um, print-based or even horizontal online-based asset that doesn't have focus and doesn't have that narrow cast view, I think it is going to be harder to make money um, from those sort of assets unless you evolve your business model to move away from audience in terms of volume and CPM and look at CPL. If you then you know, can convert your model to, uh, to, to be centered on lead generation, then of course that is something that actually does work and isn't that expensive to build. However, you were one of the pioneers of kind of doing that lead generation stuff in kind of B2B and Insights, you've been doing it for some years. How has that model evolved? Can you just explain how you make money out of lead generation? Um, well, I, um, I can't take the credit for it, to be frank. Um, but uh, we we have we have been uh, really quite successful in helping build some of our uh, tougher B two B end markets with with the lead gen engine we've got. And in everything I've done, I mean, Rory's in the crowd. Rory uh, worked with me uh, for a while. You know, I my my mantra is uh, creativity is great, plagiarism is faster. So what we do in Incisive is we look, frankly, to um, copy, steal, nick any good idea that others do. That's um, why I don't talk to you. Yeah, and try and, and try and do it better. So with lead gen, you know, we looked at the growth in lead gen in the US and we've seen um, businesses like Knowledge Storm in our market or Tech Target doing reasonably well. Tech Target a bit behind Knowledge Storm, to be fair, having bought them. Um, but we looked at that model and it's a very simple model of thought leadership and white papers. Um, and uh, we just created libraries of uh, white paper content across a range of our different assets. Um, we made sure the taxonomy was right. Um, and we then, um, for people to download that content for free, which was thought leadership and useful in their day jobs, um, we, we basically took a lot of information off them. So it's like, a red, again, going back to the old days of controlled circulation magazines, the only way in which you could get a controlled circ magazine in the 80s is if you filled in a registration card. We, do, we apply those principles to our lead gen engine and our lead gen model. So great quality content at the back that's timely, sometimes written by us, sometimes but written by the experts. But then uh, we charge uh, customers who want you know, those leads in a various product line, a, a very significant amount of money per lead. And, and we roll that across IT, accountancy, and believe it or not, in legal. Very, a completely different engine in legal. So we don't charge per lead in legal, we charge for actually the white papers to be published. Um, and then we, guard, we take the leads and go back to the law firm and create a great um, sort of seminar uh, type products for them, which we again charge uh, for. So we, we become much more uh, involved in the marketing services set led type solution as opposed to just being a pure play publisher. That's interesting. I was talking just before we came on to um, the marketing director of the BMJ and they do exactly the same thing mm. with their BMG, BMJ open product where they're charging the, uh, they're charging the author to publish the, to publish the paper. They're still doing peer review for editorial quality and content, but it's exactly, it's interestingly exactly the same model that you're, that you're just describing. Let's go back in history again, because, you know, I, I, you know, the younger you, you know, we can, we can be nostalgic. Um, you had a pretty good career going. It was all going all right. You worked for a couple of companies and, you know, we're doing okay. And then suddenly you struck out on your own and not many people do that. Not many people did it back then. What made you do it? <laughs> um, my, wife, um, my wife moves markets whenever she leaves the door. She's <laughs> um, what made me do it? Um, well, again, uh, uh, luck. Luck, accident, not necessarily design. So I was a, um, dare I say, a reasonably successful director of Centaur, their youngest director by a stretch. And I then um, got offered a job by Reuters to go and launch a, an information division. 
for them where they were looking to um, uh, basically disseminate information and content they already had within the Reuters business into, believe it or not, a print form. So here's a pure play electronic business back in 1994 that actually wanted to go print and go very, very narrow and produce newsletters for vertical audiences. Um, and I, I went for the money, if you really want to know, um, because well, they paid that, me. That explains why you went to Reuters. Yeah, yeah. I, I okay, that, so but... here we are, and this is where my... my and um, I know they bailed is... out of the deal. So. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I went to Reuters, and within three days of joining Reuters, having been a director of Centaur, um, Marketing Week wrote an article on the fact that I joined Reuters Publishing as MD, and uh, Nick Hyam then wrote an analysis piece saying, will Reuters be re by Reed Elsevier? And of course, in those days, the press cuttings from Marketing Week went up to the main board. And at the time, Peter Jobs said to my immediate boss, who the fuck is this bloke? Who is this guy? What have we done? So I discovered within three days of joining Reuters that my appointment hadn't been approved by the main board. And I was taken on literally as a whim by the UK and Ireland CEO, who uh, did actually get onto the main board, but wasn't on the main board. And at the same time, he was wanting to move Reuters into print, but also TV. Uh, and um, within three days, when I said, look, can I print a business card? And they said, no, I knew my time was up. So uh, a long-winded answer. Are, are you uh, really telling us that uh, yeah. had that not have happened, you yeah. would not have gone off well, on your no, own? Well, no, look, I mean, I come from a, um, I'm, I think I have been strongly influenced by my background, I'm adopted, uh, my brother and sister are adopted, I don't, you know, I, I think that's an actual, uh, an important driver in me that I've, um, through that, I've sort of, I've been independent. I, I've always wanted to do something on my own. Even when I worked for Centaur, when I worked for, um, uh, for VNU, my aspiration was to be in control of my own destiny. My father was, um, and he was an extremely extraordinary, expiring uh, character. Unfortunately, he died um, two years before I was able to set up my business. But um, the, yes, the actual impetus for me to go and do what I did was because I realized that Reuters had no intention of doing the job that it had offered me to do. However, I didn't leave, give me one second, I didn't leave day three. I then spent six months researching this idea that I had. Um, I um, uh, spent many months uh, talking to um, Colin Morrison and Kevin Hand back then, potentially about buying Money Week, which is a failed EMAP uh, B2B mag. Um, and the whole business model around Investment Week was built on replacing Money Week, which we knew was going to close. So um, all we did was try and create a very narrow, focused product back then um, to replace Money Week. And as soon as I sort of had the balls to do it, I went out and raised the money and did it. So it, is that really what it requires, is balls? Because well, the reason I'm asking you this question is, is, is not really because I'm that interested, but, but because I'm wondering <laughs> but because I'm wondering why so few people do it. If, I mean, I would have thought that particularly now, with so much change happening in business media and media in general, and I think that creates an enormous amount of kind of opportunity, that we would be seeing lots of people who were the age that you were when you did this, thinking well, no, about th doing stuff on their own, and yet I, I'm not seeing very much of it. Well, I mean, I look back at, um, I, I, I think, I, the, the, I, I look at the VNU intake of my year, and there are some unbelievably successful people who've gone off and built substantial businesses, amazing businesses, Chris Anderson, you know, he built Future um, Publishing. He uh, then built, uh, brain's gone dead, but after he got divorced, he sold it to Murdoch for $600 million, uh, a games business. He now runs TED. You know, he's an ex-Vianui, Vianui, there's me. Um, there's, um, not saying I'm anything on, on, his, uh, on his scale, but we've got a lot of people who actually went off and run their, built their own recruitment businesses. So S3 is built by X VNU people. Harvey Nash was built by X VNU people. I mean, these are these are businesses that are worth now four or five hundred million quid. So, I think it was something that was inbuilt. You know, we had the confidence to have a go, but actually, when you've got three children under the age of five, and you've got mouths to feed, it is scary. And and sometimes you get there through accident more than design. If um, I, I forget how old your children are, but they're quite grown up now, aren't they? So, yeah, they are. Yeah, so, um, so if they, if they were stupid enough, um, if they wanted to follow in their father's footsteps in, uh, in some way and uh, 
learn a bit about you know working in media. I think one of them does work in media. Am I right? Yeah. So, um, what would you tell them to do? What would your or put it another way? What would your advice to your 28-year-old self be? Or what? How might you translate that to your kids or to anybody else who's working in business media right now? But what they might do next? Don't believe your own bullshit. Um, God, Tim, really? <laughs> yeah. You spent, build a career on that. Well, don't believe your own bullshit. Um, we have a lot of people who walk the walk and don't talk. Uh, sorry, talk the talk, but don't walk the walk. I think, you know, you, you are going to be judged through your actions. And cha- our, the one thing that is so exciting about our business is the change that is going on. You know, is the opportunity to do literally every minute of every day something new, something fresh. And look, you know, since t- technology, I go, technology, I think, gets in the way. It is just an enabler. We get confused about what our job is. So my advice, actually, to my daughter and um, a number of, I mean, I've got uh, nine people who graduated who were mates of my daughter who are now working at Incisive. Um, and I'm really thrilled that we've been, a- we've been able to, tr- to attract that sort of talent into the business. You know, it's really tough for these kids to get jobs at the moment. It sounds but more the, like nepotism. Than, well, I don't than care talent. because they're talented people, they're energetic people, and they want to learn. And I think the key thing is about, you know, th- these guys are consumers of uh, various devices and content. You know, they, they, they can teach some of us older folk quite a bit. You know, they are, they are very valuable assets to have in the business. By my advice to them is, look, just... Don't every single person who comes into incisive media, and we I still see we do an induction, and again, Rory might remember this. I encourage people to make mistakes. I say to people, Look, I really don't mind if you make a mistake, I don't even mind if you make that mistake twice, the same mistake twice. But what I am asking you, what I ask you to do is do the job in a different way from the person who did that job before. Because unless you do try and change your approach, unless you try and change. Um, you know, the way we do things, we won't evolve and we won't, frankly, take advantage of the opportunities in the market. So um, third mistake, you might get a bollocking. Yeah, but, you, you know, we've got we to gotta just take risks and have a go. It's quite exciting. Um, well, let's, let, let's talk about mistakes. Um, ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's been a difficult journey for Incisive. I mean, it's no, it's no secret. And um, uh, when you did your deal... Uh, with Apex, uh, and you took on a pretty large amount of debt. I guess on one of those plans, it says as long as the, as long as the profits keep growing, it'll be fine, and the burden of debt will get smaller. And the reverse happened. If you look back on that, and I know you were very keen to get off the public market for all kinds of very good reasons, but do you regret ever making that decision? Would you not have been better off sitting where Wilmington are or where Centaur are with a sort of a stuck share price, but at least, you know, not where you are no. now? Okay. The primary motivation for taking the business off the public market was to sell the business, to take money off the table. You know, I had got to um, my 12th year in business. Yes, I'd taken a few quid off the table, but my primary motivation was to take as much, frankly, money off the table I could and still run the business because I love the business. So we didn't take the business off the public markets just to go on a buy and build nut strategy. We took the business off the public markets because we sold it. And we sold it at 14.6 times our historic EBITDA and 30, sorry, 14.6 times our forecast EBITDA and 17.9 times our historic EBITDA. And um, I then ruled, and we paid, the Apex paid a um, 36% premium to the prevailing share price. When I did a director's placing in 2005, I had to sell my shares at a 10% discount. And immediately I sold my shares, the share price um, increased by 22% because it was an overhang. So my primary motivation was to take money off the table, make myself secure you know, for life, make my founding uh, directors secure for life, to create um, an opportunity where staff who had options in the business could exercise those options and actually take a really nice gain and, you know, People like my PA took a lot of money off the table. She's worked for me, bless her, for 27 years. She deserves it. So that's the primary motivation. The second motivation was because I love what I do, was to continue being in the business. So it's rare that you can sell a business, actually, and still be in it. Um, Certainly, if you sell to a trade, there's no way I would be in, in the business. So the mistake, the hindsight mistake, 
was, of course, um, we went off the market, and the only way that price was paid was um, because of the leverage that was put into the structure. And that actually, I'm not, it, was, it was my responsibility because I was the CEO, but actually it wasn't me who gave, I didn't get that package. The banks lent it to us. Um, and when we went out and syndicated that debt, four months after we went off the public market, we got five million quids worth of reverse flex. We, you know, we negotiated five million quids worth of additional value. And we delevered following the VNU, CVP, um, and MSN acquisition. And then we relevered back up when we bought ALM. And the big problem we had was when we bought ALM uh, for $630 million, $450 million of that financing was debt financing. And we, that was underwritten by RBS. And they said, we'll go out and syndicate that structure um, in September or October, two or three months after the deal's completed. Ah, uh, that's September. Yes. So the debt market's collapsed. Um, and you went from uh, being able to get nine and a half times Covlight deals to literally within three months, uh, seven, within another month, five and a half, to when EMAP went, it was actually five. Yeah, and today it's about two. Yeah. So, um, but the lesson learned, and it is a harsh lesson, lesson because, okay, I took my, I took the shares off the table, sold the business, basically at where the share price was, and then I rolled the premium into the structure. So the 36% premium they paid by us out, I rolled in. So I actually wrote a very large check, you know, a lot, very large check. The lesson learned, it evaporated, I can tell you, in a week. That, it didn't just go slowly down like the share price of Wilmington or the share price of Centaur or the share price of UBM because or Informa. Because the structure. Yeah. It went to zero. Overnight. Can I, can I just test something with you? Some people would say, I mean, your analysis that you gave earlier for why you did what you did, I think everybody would kind of get that. You know, I mean, that all kind of makes sense. You know, security for the family, give people who worked here a long time an opportunity to trade out their options and so on and so on. But some people would say that's completely upside down. That actually making that decision was not in the best long term interests of the growth of the business as a whole. It might have been the right thing to do for those, those objectives, but n was not the right thing to do in order to prepare it for perhaps what we might not have been able to see coming, but it left you very vulnerable to exactly what did happen, which well, was a, no, no, a change on. in the way no, no, in which no, the financial look, market look, worked. Look, I bought, let's just uh, take a, 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 a more crass analogy. I bought a house in Chelsea, okay, and I, I had a sodding great big mortgage to buy that house, and um, the value of that house in the open market fell below the mortgage. I'm still living in the fucking house. Okay? I still live in the house. Actually, I've been able to put an extension on the back. The business I have taken off the market today is bigger than it was when we took it off the market. So whilst that, you- That's worth remembering. I don't think is, a lot of people know that. Yeah, it, that's, it, that's it is a know. balance sheet problem. So what blew up was not the company, it was the balance sheet. And yes, of course, like every other B2B business, we were not alone. Earnings fell, revenue fell, so that we breached the covenant. So the value in the business fell, not in the asset value you had in that house, but in the mortgage. So I had negative equity. So the people who had the fulcrum negotiation in our restructuring were the banks. So the banks just took ownership of it. Now to me, and I'm sorry, Apex, because we had a really good relationship, at the end of the day, that's life. And we cut a deal with the banks where we can still live in the house. And guess what? We own quite a big chunk of it and we're rebuilding in the private arena um, where we have grown consecutively for the last three years, a significant double digit ahead of our peers, and actually the outlook is relatively good. But we've got to continue to grow. And there is no question, I would suggest, that in the next, uh, because we have a maturity on our debt of 2013, in the next um, you know, year, uh, we will hopefully have done something with the business that will put it into a, uh, in terms of its balance sheet, into another, another, uh, another light, in, a, in another, another situation. There's only, that, that's going to bring me on to kind of mm. where I'm going to get to, to the end of this, really, which is, I mean, there's only a couple of ways to fix a kind of balance sheet problem, and one of them is growth, which is the interesting one to talk yeah. about. What are the kind of the top three things that Incisive is going to do to grow? I mean, most business media companies have had Suboptimal growth, I guess, would be the kind of the kind way of putting it, and, and it's been it's been very difficult. Even the very major companies, the results announced this week, Reed Elsevier's results, 
uh, United results a bit better, you know, former results pretty flat, you know, doing all right, you know, still making a lot of money. But these don't look like fast growth businesses, notwithstanding the fact that they have already transitioned substantially from an old strategy to a new. What are you going to do at Incisive to deliver that well, kind of yeah, it, rapid growth that you need, given your balance sheet issue? Well, it, it's the continuation of what we've been doing um, really for a number of years. I mean, as you said, I mean, we launched our first uh, online property in 1995. So we've been doing, doing stuff online for some time. I have to say the experience then was shite. It was a really bad product, but we made a lot of money from it because the user experience was so bad. But now the user experience is so good, we're making even more money. So we, we are, look, we have a lot of print assets. There's no question. Um, but actually of our, I mean, our, we are, we're a, we're a business actually that has a, the largest minority of our revenues come from our event business, which is a, a global business that is growing and continue to grow, to grow. And it's a branded event business. So we use our brands and the communities that we serve to build in-person product or virtual product. Um, and that, that part of our business is about 40% uh, percent of what we do. It's about 48 million of our revenues. And our publishing business is around 50-50 online and 50% 50, 50 print. We've got some print assets that I think uh, will still continue to thrive. But, um, we have very few print assets that are uh, recruitment dependent. I mean, so we, the one we had that had uh, issues was Accounts the Age, which we've closed, and it's now pure play on online and lead gen. Uh, computing, when we bought computing um, in uh, 2007, it had a control circulation of 140,000. Uh, it now has a control circulation of 20,000. We've narrow casted it. It now is sent to those people who are buyers. And it's un I, with Computer Weekly going, it is now, we are now growing the print asset of computing as well as growing the online uh, piece because it is fit for purpose and used uh, in that community to, to, to brand build. Is, it, is there any way, I mean, given what you just said about jobs uh, again because the reason you're not dependent on recruitment is because you lost it all I suppose you could take <laughs> well, we, lo lost, we lost it all but, before I bought it but, yeah no, no, yeah. sure 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 I mean one is there any way that uh, business media brands can win back well, recruitment money from yeah. from the from the horizontal well, jobs we're, we're doing it we recruited Simon Devitt out of Haymarket um, just over a year ago and our our recruitment revenue from a low base um, is and now about and it's all online it's about three and a half percent of what we do we're building very narrow cast boards we've launched something called the social cv which is i think an extraordinary uh, innovative uh, online what, what is that prop the social cv basically is an aggregate we had a we had a, an investment in a business called workhound it's like simply uh, hired or indeed it's a vertical aggregator sorry an a jobs aggregator but we've re reversed that aggregator on its head and the social CV scrapes every post that you make, whether it's on Flickr, or on Twitter, or on LinkedIn, or on Facebook, and brings it back into a neat formed uh, database of, um, of who your, what your social CV is. And we think that's a, uh, frankly, a much truer version of the flat uh, CV that you write on LinkedIn. That is, you know, you writing a CV that you want people to see for your job, whereas the social CV is really you. But we're using the social CV to actually back end some of our uh, CV databases. And uh, we've got about 18 million um, contacts on that database. So we're not, we're, we're looking at new models in recruitment. Plus, though, investing in very focused boards where we've got narrow cast properties that have real strength in those, in those communities. So, it, it, you know, and we're making, we're making good money. We probably make a million quid out of our recruitment business from pretty much nowhere in terms of profit. Okay, um, we've got about five minutes left. So if anybody wants to ask something, now is the time to wave at me and uh, I'll try to do it. Yes, sir, say, say who you are if you don't mind. Just wait for the microphone, it's just coming from uh, behind you. Sure. My name's Mark Needham. And just following on that, that point about the social CV, so who are you selling that to? Are you selling a potential employer a picture of me falling over drunk on Facebook? to warn them off, is that, is that the idea? No, it's sold on a site license basis to recruiters, right. to um, HR departments and uh, recruitment companies, um, because it allows them both to search by company. So if you want to know, you know every employee in Google in the UK, um, we can actually you know, look, because we've actually got access into their Gmail account as well, because right. we, we work with them 
we, um, we, uh, and it has a, has a profile on, on you. It's not just, it's not just you, you know, smoking a spliff or falling over, getting pissed. It's what you tweet. It's what you have on your Facebook page. It's, it's much deeper than that. Yeah. And um, it's, a, it's an interesting property for us. But, that we're but it's commissioned by the candidate, is it? So the candidate no, no, it's all public domain information. All public domain. Okay. So all we're doing is scraping stuff that actually. No, that's is why out this there. gentleman was looking so that's sprightly. Right. Yes, that's right. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, so, but you're selling it to a HR departments to warn them off people who are smoking. Sports, no, we it? are selling it to HR departments so that they can search if they look for a marketing executive and they have a specific company they want to recruit that from. They can use the social CV to do that search. Okay. Okay, and it will give you the location, email address, a lot of data on the individual. But also then, yeah, a social graph, you know, what they tweet, what, what interests them, because we've just used pretty simple semantic search to bring it all together. How much do people pay for that? That sounds... It's like it could a be. grand. It's well at the moment we're at the beginning, so uh, to be honest, within these four walls is what we can bloody get. But um, it, the idea is it's a, it's a grand per seat. Some things about old VNU never change. No. Do they? But, yeah. Well, it's you know when you build a site license subscription model, you you know at the beginning you have to see what you can get and then yeah. you build from it. Anybody else, sir? And then uh, and then. Paddy uh, hey. Um how do you balance the fact uh, with your monthly and weekly titles? How do you, you balance the fact that most of the news articles, um, the information is already in the public domain? Is it a big issue for you? Well, I think that's a very good question because actually, if if any of our monthlies or weeklies now are what I would describe as just news papers, they will die. And culturally, I'm what I'm proud of, uh, of probably most in the last couple of years is how we've moved journalists along to uh, publish web first. And um, we have a, a mantra at the moment within the business where we call it the three R's, where in its readers, research, relaunch. And what we're trying to do is make sure, uh, and we are very successful at it now, that actually the print asset is not uh, uh, the online uh, in print. It is not, you know, the print asset is something more. The Economist is a news weekly, which is phenomenally successful because it goes behind the scenes of the major news of that week. And that's what our, our major news properties need, weeklies need to do. They need to um, use the fact they may have an alert, you know, and a news alert, a news story has gone out, um, not on the desktop, but actually to the, to the mobile. Um, or to the inbox. I mean, that's our strategy. We basically don't care what the device is. We want to push content into the inbox and make sure we have the technology to enable the consumer to consume it on the right device so we can recognize what device they're, they're consuming the content on. So none of our print assets are a replica of what we do online, and none of our online assets are a replica of what we do in print. And Investment Week is a great case in point. You know, that, when I launched it, was a 120-page weekly that had news from the front page probably to page 80, because it's a very deep news-driven product. Now um, it's a news analysis and opinion-forming print asset, still incredibly successful, um, still um, growing, grew 18% uh, last year, probably a recovery year, but in print. And our online property grew um, uh, over 20% um, in that market. So news is delivered in real time, so can consumers can consume it you know, wherever they are on whatever device they're using. And again, if you look at the um, consumption habits and the engagement of our communities, people will either engage with our content through mobile early in the morning or late in the day. They sit then at their desktop and will consume through inbox in another way and go maybe into the destination site. But also they're using our, you know, we've got on Legal Week, for example, 16,000 Twitter followers on Legal Week. So they might get their news that way. So whatever way they want to consume the news, we will deliver it in that format. Every, every one of our properties, again, has LinkedIn groups as way in which we can distribute news. Now, sorry, just to ramble on one more. News isn't a commodity, though, because one of the things that's incredibly expensive to... Um, to do in the markets that we serve is hire good quality journalists. You know, I mean, I, I again battle with some consultants out there who think that pure plays will buy their way in to our markets. And again, Rory will know this. We have not had a pure play compete with us in the last 15 years because, you know, on risk, as an example, we've got probably 60 journalists in that suite of products. 
that are bloody well paid and extremely experienced and investigative. You know, the news that they write gets under the, gets, you know, you, they get under the skin of the community. And it's news sometimes that the community doesn't want to see delivered. Um, so we're not, you know, we do not rewrite press releases. We write the news that's of import to the markets we serve and add value to it through some form of curation or editorship, which is key. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll come to this after, um, uh, Rod Banner, who you know. Uh, yeah. yeah, we all know Rod Banner. Uh, re yeah, Tim Weller, he tweets, reckons B2B, the magazine market, is fundamentally the same as 30 years ago. What is he smoking? <laughs> um, but I, I, th I think, for purposes, you didn't quite mean it in the... In, no, uh, the it's a bit the, out of context. No, no, it's more exciting, there's more to do. But uh, frankly, we, um, my point is people overcomplicate it. You know, our business communities are still doing jobs in those communities and their jobs are actually will evolve through good quality content their careers will evolve through good quality content final question yes. hello my name is olivia shannon um i was wondering if you could tell us a little more about your approach to mobile platforms and how that's different from what you do with print and web and like ebooks and apps and things like that okay um well again it, go it goes back to making sure that actually content can be consumed in the way in which our customers want that content to be consumed. So we, uh, M. Dot and Noble, um, um, uh, uh, all of our uh, 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 websites two years ago, so we can recognize what device it is that someone comes in on. So the first thing is, um, you know, that actually you, you deliver the content in a form that people can actually see on the mobile. We have a very aggressive push strategy to the inbox, email strategy. So one of the things that we've been doing recently is to make sure that we can, one, authenticate who our customers are. We put registration walls on our uh, free sites. We put paywalls on our free sites. And we've asked people to opt in to various lines of content they want to receive. So again, through you know, taxonomy and tagging, we can basically push the relevant content to Inbox. And we've been experimenting um, again with apps. So we started off with Favicums very simple, so people at least could launch the browser on the mobile or on their iPad or on whatever device it was. Um, and now, of course, we're, we actually have launched a number of uh, dedicated apps that are in the newsstand store, and that's been a fascinating learning curve for us. Um, again, looking to experiment with the business model. So we actually perversely started with um, our app uh, uh, strategy on our two at uh, least, I suppose, loved or cherished brands because they're consumer-facing brands. They are, they're perceived to be as small brands and non-core to the business. So we started, our first app went live on British Journal Photography. And the strategy there was not necessarily to generate subscription income, but to get a big bag sponsor where we could actually charge them on download. So um, British Journal Photography, which sells 6,000 copies a month, yesterday reached its thousandth, hundred thousandth download globally. It's a beautiful app. Um, Hasselbad were the sponsor. We made a lot of money on it. We're using the Magplus, pl Magplus platform for it. Plus, we then generated uh, 4,800 pure play subscriptions off of the back of it. So, and it's not a replica of the online, uh, of the print piece or the online piece. It is a, a very different uh, property with a lot of video embedded uh, content on it for a, for a project like that. We've also then with Investment Week, Investment Week is going live um, at the end of uh, this month as is FX Week. So some of our free to wear B2B stuff um, is going live. And again, it's making sure we can deliver content in the format in which our customers want it. However, with Investment Week, the exciting thing there is, again, going back to copying what others do well, is we're using the HTML5 wrap um, like the FT does to be able to deliver news as it happens through you know, an RSS feed hitting the app so people can download that app and get news as it's delivered to the website or delivered to the, to the mobile uh, in real time. So they get the edition, the weekly edition, and the daily content that feeds in as well. So there's more to it um, than just uh, the, the website or the, the print asset. But experiment, experiment like hell, I think, again, is the other key thing. Some stuff will work, some stuff won't. So we're using multiple platform providers. Uh, please put your hands again and say thank you to Tim for being a good sport.